welcome. This is Dr. John Martini. This is one of the most amazing and inspiring shows that you can listen into. If you want to be on the edge of your seats, if you want to open up your heart, if you want to expand your mind, and you want to meet incredible people, stay tuned because you're just about to experience a transformative radio show that will change your life. And you're listening to the Dr. Pat Show is coming up right next. Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Talk radio to thrive by. Powerful, inspiring, and coming to you live, bringing you stories of people like you and me, busting through and living life full out. Get ready to dare to wonder what your life would be like if you knew you could not fail. Welcome. It's so great to have all of you tune us in and turn us on. Um, I have got a great, great guest today. Um, And you know what I love about that? is what is it that we're called to bring into the world? Um, What is it for many of us that we think about our lives and we find ourselves on a pathway? And that pathway takes us to um, becoming internationally renowned as somebody in the world that is helping other people. And one of the things I love about this is when I think about Dr. Catherine Shaneberg, who's joining me here today, and I think about what it means to be an internationally renowned transpersonal psychologist, a lecturer, teacher, visionary, award-winning author, um, grounded in ancient Kabbalah of light, or somebody says, some people say Kabbalah, some people say Kabbalah, say, you know, so we're going to hear the, what she says, just like it's like working with Sarah Main and learning ancient Sanskrit. But the point is this, when you're in the world, you understand a couple of different things. One, you understand that there's so much timeless wisdom in the world that we're on the verge of forgetting if we don't have people like Catherine today to remind us, if we don't have these beautiful, beautiful ways to bring such timelessness to our contemporary time. And why is that important? It's important because we need this now. I don't think anybody would have predicted, and all you got to do is turn on a couple of television shows. And what you're going to find is as you turn those shows on, people say one thing, we've never experienced this before. We've never been here before. But maybe we have, and maybe we just don't know it because these times go so far back. But there was a solution. It's ancient. It ignites the imagination. It will illuminate the soul. And that is the Kabbalah of light. Uh, Dr. Shainberg, great to have you. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be with you today. (laughs) I'm glad you're here. Um, uh, When I went back to school, I wanted to grow up to be like you. And, you know, what I found, I know you're thinking real. Yeah, you didn't know me, so. (laughs) But I did. I I did in a sense. And what I mean by that is I went down a pathway to really learn some things that I was not going to be a psychologist. I was not going to do that body of work. I was not going to practice clinical psychology because when I came back home after going to school in California, the rules were very, very strict. We couldn't have a conversation like the one we're having right now, in a sense. But I want to know from you, your life pathway, and when was your heart touched in a way where your heart-opening aha moment caused you to see a vision for your life that brought you right here today? I always had it. My first memories are of creating images and using those images to help people. So even at two, three years old, um, I was doing this. Um, I, I have described this little story of the homeless lady who lived across the street from us. And every night I would wave to her and then I would cover her in light, blankets of light, so that she'd be comfortable for the night. <laughs> so I've always had that, and all my the drawings that my mother kept of, of me as a tiny child are drawings of angelic beings, uh, 
surrounding the house, surrounding people, helping them. So it's been part of my soul, I think, mm. from the beginning. Yeah. You know, there's a there's something on your website I, uh, that, that well, there are a lot of things on your website I want to talk to you about, but it's not a website. It's really a, a way to show up and show out in the world. See, that's the way I see these these things in technology now. We call yeah. them websites, we call them phones, but that's not what they really are. They're really a way, a gateway. And on your site, you know, one of the questions you ask is, do you know who uh, who you really are. But then there's another, there's a very important thing that you say. And you talk about the subconscious mind as being a gateway, creating the life you dream of. And I love that we're talking about that. Now, I will tell you that Hollywood has made a multi billion dollar, right, revenue stream at a talking about subconscious gateway in the multiverse, right? But from this perspective, what does our subconscious give us? What is the gift of understanding our subconscious mind? Well, the subconscious mind is your truth. If you tap into it, if you gaze in, you're going to get the truth about what you feel, about whatever is happening in your life. You can ask a question or you have a question on your mind. And the, if you look inside, it's going to tell you something that may be very different from what your mind is telling you. Now, I'm not at all against the mind. I want to say that right away because we need the conscious mind to be looking in. That's the work that the conscious mind needs to do. And then ask the question. And if the question is, should I take this job? And you see a steel door closing in front of you. Right? <laughs> it's a very clear answer. <laughs> I always give the, the example of, um, you know, you want a million dollars, you want to manifest a million dollars, it's just not going to work that way. You've got to go inside and ask, should I be asking for a million dollars? And if you get a tent, well, it's certainly not <laughs> your way. If you get a palace, maybe it's your way, right? Yeah then you're meant to be uh, and to manifest a million dollars. We can't manifest unless we dream it. Yeah. I so, I'm so glad you brought this up. I want to really get to this. I was reading your book, and I, um, I've i done a number of interviews with Gloria Stein, and I met her when I was in my corporate job, and I stood beside her marching for women's rights, whatever that, whatever you want to call that, you know. But it was a really important part of my life. It was what shaped me. But I love the quote in your book, without leaps of imagination or dreaming, we lose the excitement of possibilities. Dreaming, after all, is a form of planning. And this is so important because, gosh, don't we need to dream again? So many people have sort of given up on that idea. But I'll tell you this, I'm here today because... I was driving across the across the I-90 bridge and my entire windshield lit up one day and I saw the network that I was to build. I saw the channels. I'm not kidding. It was like right there. Um, it was so clear. It was scary. And then I, I had to act on it. I totally, totally understand because when I was 28, I saw the school. All the school, all the arc of the school and the students and the different... Uh, um, parts of the school that would be developed. And I saw the books. It was all there. Yeah. So I yeah. just followed it, as you have, right? Yeah. And I, I think that, that our soul knows exactly what needs to be done. And the issue mm -hmm. is how to tap into our soul so that it will show us what is in the way of our seeing what we need to see, mm -hmm. right? So there are many things in the way, of course. You know, it's like a great, um, the, the imagination is the great river that makes us. I believe we're made of dream. Yeah. We, are, we are energetic fields, and these energetic fields have a particular mission in life. Yeah. Are we going to fulfill it? That's the question. I want to ask you this 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 point though, because there's a line in the book that I love, and there are many things in the book, but I think this is a great way to really get at 
some of the things that just hold us back. One of the things I think you say is, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the conscious mind is the antagonist to the unconscious. The conscious mind is a na is naturally, I think you say naturally antagonistic. Okay, yeah. naturally antagonistic to the unconscious. And I thought we got to talk about that because we do <laughs> some because sometimes don't you find that we want to we want to avoid the whole idea of the conscious mind, the, the naturally antagonistic element, but. Isn't there as as in a, as essentially when you put these two together, whether it be naturally antagonistic or not, isn't there a great message? Oh yeah, I mean, in in because you know my work is is based on a fundamental mystical Judaism, right? So yes, one of the things that is said is God creates Eve to be against Adam against, kinigdu, and we need the against, we need the push. So we need the two minds to be slightly antagonistic so that the, 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 the conscious mind is going on about this job that is gonna be fantastic and bring us a lot of money and, and celebrity, and the subconscious is saying, hey, there's a steel door closing there. <clears throat> and so we have two um, different movements. And the work is really mm -hmm. to bring them to talk to each other. Yeah. To yeah, find a dialogue. You know, do you think, I mean, we can't know, but I've often thought about when Freud, you know, started to, to just kind of dig deep into this area of unconscious mind. I don't think he had a clue in a sense to the depth by which you wrote about in this book or that we really need to understand this in today's world. I mean, I, I, of course, he understood the unconscious mind and the store of memories, but we're really talking something much more multi-layered here as well, yeah. right? Maybe even multi-layered spiritual as well, soul intent as well, right? Am, am I on track with that? Yeah. Well, think of it as a great ocean, and on top of the ocean yeah. is garbage, like we have on our oceans today. Oh boy! And what is happening on the outside is happening on the inside. There's a lot of garbage. So the first thing is what Freud was talking about, which is the repressed, uh, difficult emotions and memories that we have to clear. But then the moment you clear them, you start finding out what the subconscious is all about. It's your source of creativity. Without it, nothing grows. Nothing transforms if you don't tap, tap into the subconscious. Right? There's a part in the book where you talk <laughs> about that you changed. I really, I, you know, in reading your book, um, I always read a book and then I go back. And the second time I go back, I get, I get a sense of how a book could change a person that wrote it. About how one that would write a book like, you know, the book that you wrote, it's just, it's amazing but how you get changed, what you had to look at for yourself. And you talked about the, the very specific story uh, about the subterranean movements of your psyche and their transformation. And the sense I got was it got you Leviathan, right? I think that's correct. Um, right. But there's a story about that. And, and there's a story that is so prominent in what you write. But, you know, this is the treasure hunt, as you call it, right? And, and and it takes you at different places. But boy, we don't want to always go there and think we can shortcut it and get us to where we want. Talk about this and how it got how how you were guided to write this about how to about the raising, right? Because you come out of the gate rare, really early in the book and you mentioned that. Well, the, <laughs> it's funny because the Leviathan appeared to me one day and said, you're going to write a book about raising the Leviathan. I said, well, well what is this all about? <laughs> so the book told me what it wanted to, me to talk about, right? It's showing, it was showing me the way, right? The Leviathan is a metaphor, if you want, for the subconscious. If we don't um, entertain the subconscious and take care of it, it be, it's a wild beast. And we see it all over our society, wild beasts everywhere, right? 
getting worse and worse because people uh, have not been taught how to handle their emotions. Now, the, the subconscious is going to appear as a tumultuous ocean, as monsters, as uh, darkness and nightmares, as long as we don't start to enter into it and take care of the garbage, the stuck, the stuck places in ourselves, right? The memories that hurt. The moment we do that, we clear ourselves, enlighten ourselves, and then a path appears, a path that um, is a path of, of splendor that is going to appear for each one of us and for society if only we were to do the work, right? Yeah. It's not enough to go into the mind because the mind is analyzing. We have to go into the experience. And so when the Leviathan is, is we begin to tame the Leviathan by entering into our dreams and talking to them, dialoguing with them, and uh, even repairing them organically, repairing their necessities, the Leviathan becomes a playmate. Yeah. Which is what is described in the Bible. God created the Leviathan to play with. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, let's 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 link the bridge to this for a minute, if we could, yeah. Yeah. because the bridge that gets linked to this has to do with dreaming. It yeah. has to do with understanding not just the way we like to understand it at a surface level, but really taking a look at dreaming from the perspective of of what's involved from a physiological right idea but also more about what's involved with the the way that our dreams can cultivate or invite us to the future that we want or the future we should be aware of i mean this is important to you because this is another body of work that you've done right yeah. you know you talk um, about dreaming as a, yeah well, I think yeah. you call it dream, dreaming. What did you, what do you say? Dreaming is a, a survival a faculty of the brain. But this has become also part of your life journey. This is also part of your messaging to help us understand not just what dreaming is, but the role it plays in our existence. Well, I think it's been uh, demoted incredibly by the psychologists, which is a great pity. I think that it's uh, one of the great uh, tools that we have to transform and that every night, like God, we hover over the, the abyss or the darkness and suddenly light appears and we're given answers to our questions and people forget how important that is. They see a nightmare and they give a pill. You don't need a pill for a nightmare. You need to enter into it and somebody's knocking at the door wanting to come in well let me put and put some uh, um light around myself a shield of light i'll open the door and find out what the guy has to say and the guy may say i'm here to to tell you that you're going to have a problem with the boss if you don't repair this <laughs> <laughs> and so the, the dream is is trying to shake you up and show you the way, right? It's yeah. such a great, great tool. It's one of the greatest tools that we have because the dream is about your truth and it's showing you your truth. It's wanting to guide you towards your, your balance and your development. It's a, it's a ladder towards enlightenment, in fact, right? Yeah, but that's that's the beginning of it. Is basically, I have a dream at night that answers one of my anxieties or questions. I need to write it down. I need to take a look at it. I need to, um, if it has a necessity, I need to go back into the dream and start responding to the necessity. So the toilets are blocked. Let me clear the toilets. And it's yeah. amazing if you do that in the subconscious, it takes half a second and your life changes because the subconscious rules everything. Oh, it does. What the, it does. This is what the, the uh, you know, the psychologists of today have, social psychology has studied. 
it shows that more than 95% of our work is done subconsciously. Our decisions are taken in the subconscious. Yeah, even moment to moment. You see, that's really, really, that's really, I think, what the beauty and insidious nature of this is, is that we are so unaware of moment to moment decisions, right? You know, do I take the SUV today or the sports car, right? I mean, we we don't really quite understand the nature of it. But one of the other things, too, that you also uh, have brought to the world is a much deeper understanding of this. You know, whether whether we're looking at um, the School of Images, and I want to make sure everybody knows, you know, Dr. Catherine is joining me here today. We're talking about an incredible book, and I want to make sure all of you know, where can people get the book? Let's start with that, if we could. Is it available in Amazon in most places? Amazon, Barnes & Nobles. I right. mean, I, I actually don't know because this is part of my life. I leave to other people. Yes, but I yeah, get it. So it's, it's out everywhere. And it's going to be in audio and Kindle on the 25th of July. Yeah, I'm really looking forward. I'm really looking forward to the audio. Um, the other thing, too, is, you know, let's make sure people know how to, you know, connect with you. Let's talk about the School of Images for a minute. Schoolofimages.com, everyone, is the website. Uh, it's school- going to change, by the way. It's going to become the schoolofimages.org. We have a new website coming up in the next few days. That is such a smart move to go in that direction. That is like brilliant. (laughs) Um, You know, we're living in a world, and I made a comment at the beginning about the world we're living in, how people talk about we've never been here before. And yet, if, if, if you dabble a little bit in any kind of history, especially history that's not about the United States, you know, you go and you look at places like Israel. Or you look at places that nine times out of 10, the only way you look at them is through some crazy headline. But you look at the deep, rich thousands and thousands of years, right, of of what people have created on this earth. And we're still baffled today. But it's almost to me unusual to hear people say we've never been through this before because historically, cultures have been through horrific times, just horrific. unbelievable times, right? But I do think there's a change. Yeah. And the change is that we are, the time, the change is too fast. That's it. Yeah. So we don't have time to settle into the change and move into the next, uh, you know, movement of, of development or evolution uh-huh. of the world. I mean, you know, a hundred years ago, we had the first planes, maybe, right? Yeah. And now, now we're on the internet, and we want it right away. Yep. I mean, it's it's crazy how fast it's gone, and it's going to yep. go faster. Yeah, and that's really the point. Is this? I mean, if you to look at the Great Pyramids, yeah, we're looking at them today, but they didn't pop up from a tweet. They didn't pop up from you know it, you know some Instagram message that you sent to somebody to create something. What is the impact of speeding up? And then what can we learn, you know, from light and light energy? Well, actually, I have a whole uh, chapter on time and how to stop time, right? It is, uh, time time doesn't exist. Time is an emotional situation. So if I learn to become quiet uh, quiet on the instant, time can expand. So when I go on holiday, <laughs> which doesn't happen much because there's always work to be done, but let's say I have two days at the beach, then I will extend that time inside of myself. I will create the space time that expands and it's, it's a space of light. There's a specific exercise in the book that describes how to do that. It takes 30 seconds. Yeah. This is also another thing that that I think is very important is how we can do this so fast while dealing with the fastness of the world. So it's not going to tell you to take uh, an hour every morning and an hour every night. It takes a minute, two minutes, and you're into that place of complete quiet and silence inside. Mm. That's going to allow you to 
to go back into the, the rat race, but in, with a different attitude. Mm. And, and allow, allow the person also to grow things in a different way. You know, when you talk about manifestation a lot, manifestation is, is uh, it's, it's a dream moment. I dream that in um, three weeks, I have to talk to Dr. Pat and I have to say something, to, but I have no idea why. So I set the intent. Three weeks, tell me what it is that I'm going to be talking about. And in three weeks, at the specific date, it appears because I trust my inside, right? <clears throat> so we, we can manifest that way in a very powerful and non-exhausting uh, way. Yeah. I love that we're talking about this because, you know, what it does for people, it helps all of us understand that we have that innate ability. And there is there are things we can learn. And you just you just said it. There are things that we can learn that don't take 10 years to do or implement. We can manifest them. We can be a present moment visionary and understand the power of dreams and dream making. Um, I want to take a short break when we come back. We're going to talk about, you know, how not just the book, but the whole body of work that you're doing, you know, underneath it all, especially sapphire imagery underneath it all, we're talking about transforming lives. You know, we're talking about something that one of my mentors said to me a very long time ago in a high desert on a vision quest. Stop thinking. Stop thinking. And I looked at Sidonia and I said, well, what do I do? <laughs> and she's, <laughs> this tells you where I was a bunch of years yeah. ago. And she said, if you stop thinking, then what will you be doing? I said, I'll be daydreaming. I might be imagining. I might be seeing things. When we come back, we're going to talk about what does it mean to have beautiful, beautiful ways to connect your present, your past, what's inside of you with what's outside, everybody. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back with Dr. Catherine. everybody welcome back um you know uh first of all i want to just tell you that this book I, I you know i honestly i don't even know why we say this book because it, it's it's just so much more than that you know when i'm when i'm all of you joining me here today is dr Catherine, dr Catherine chamber but that's not the point the point is this is a book that captures to me um messages and call to actions of our time but it's deeply grounded in um ancient jewish mystical traditions and you know and if we're lucky enough if we're fortunate enough we have gotten some exposure to that you know i i say the word uh, kabbalah i have been corrected you know um i dated uh someone that was jewish for a number of years so i got immersed in so many aspects uh, and spiritual aspects and teachings, which was such a blessing for me because at that time in my life, Catherine, it changed my life. You know, I was in my early 30s and I was a mess. I was a mess. My life, my personal life was a mess. Everything was, it was just a mess. It was crazy who I was back then. And, I, and an angel or somehow put this beautiful person in front of me. And I learned some things. I also learned that when you sit down at Seder or you sit down at ritual and they say, you know, it's time to drink the wine, you don't drink the whole glass of wine because you can have a lot of opportunities to do that. But what I learned, I know, right? But what I learned was growing up as Catholic and a Southern Baptist mom who is very open about all religious traditions. What I learned was that there was something missing in the teachings I had that didn't address who I was as a person. None of well, them explained it. Yeah, that, that is, uh, you know, I, I, want to, I want to say, though, that although this is Kabbalah, it's inner gazing. Inner gazing can be done by anyone. Exactly. I was in China, and some of the people in China wanted to copyright inner gazing or dreaming 
<laughs> completely crazy. Everybody dreams. Everybody dreams. <laughs> so although the lineage comes from a Kabbalistic background, Kabbalah means to receive. And the first receiving is I receive my own sensations, my own uh, con constraints, my own expansions, my own movements, mm. emotions, feelings. I receive that. Yeah. And I receive uh, all that in an imaginal way because this is the language of the body. Yeah. So if I'm open to it, I will, I'm looking at you and I already receive images having to do with you. So it's my relationship to you becomes a flower uh, of a particular color with a particular center to it that's quite quite beautiful, <laughs> I'm glad to say. <laughs> well, the, you know, and the reason I'm, I brought it up is because before the break, I was talking about, you know, transforming lives. And I was right. talking about, you know, what it is that you're making us aware of. Oh, but by the way, you know, every piece of your work makes us more aware. But also for me, somebody like me that grew up very different, you know, I, I couldn't speak. I stuttered. Um, but like that, Moses, Moses stuttered. I didn't know that. Good really? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> he couldn't get his soul out. He couldn't say. The soul couldn't say. So it stuttered. Right? But you know what the gift of that was for me? I learned how to listen. I learned how to ask very deep, profound questions. But mm -hmm. I also learned how to use my imagination, my imagination, you know, I didn't ruminate on thinking because thinking wasn't going to help me. And so from a very young age, I started to draw, I started to create things. But there was this knowing of things. And I think that we as people don't realize that we have the ability to be in that space. We do. And we, we don't are. trust ourselves, do we? No, we don't. I mean, we don't because... I mean, people see themselves as going to nature, but it's absurd. They are a part of nature. We are a part of nature. We are an animal walking in nature. And we forget that all the sensations, all the movements of the body are part of nature and of the truth of nature. So if I walk in a, the path that nature wants me to walk in, and then my whole body is satisfied and content. Mm. And it speaks to me in sensations, expansions, images, right? Mm -hmm. um, the mental does something else. It says, well, I can't compete. I'm not doing enough. I really need to work. And the inside is saying, just relax. <laughs> relax. Just visualize or dream what needs what your soul really wants and let it work for you let yeah. go and let god and it's going to work because that's how intention works right we create the intent for the dreaming and then we set it going tell me in three weeks time what the answer is and it's amazing that's it, it is one of the greatest challenges of our time, too. You know, I and it gets back to what you said earlier, Dr. Catherine. It gets back to the fact where things were so slower. People that were in that, you know, in those times, they had time. They could be more patient for things. But, you know, in the book, you know, you talk about Joseph. And we talk about Joseph and incubation and the sapphire imagery. And you bring back Joseph again. You talk about Joseph, the great dreamer. I don't know if that what he's called the great dreamer, yeah, but yeah. he was known, right, for the story, for the dream. Um, and if there was nothing that we could take away from the Bible, it would be to hold on to the essence of who this person was. And the power of this, because I don't think the Bible presents us with anything that we're not capable of today. Absolutely. Well, you know, he had a dream when he was a teenager that he was uh, a shaft of wheat and there were shafts of wheat all around him. There were his family and they were all bowing to him. And then he had a second dream where they were the stars and the moon and the sun, but he was the center and they were all bowing to him. And this is what we call a, a mandala or a great dream. 
right? That is showing this, what the soul is. Now we have to get the garbage out of the way to see what our soul wants to say, right? Mm. He for a moment was lucky enough that the garbage moved for a moment and he saw. <laughs> and then he described it and then all hell broke loose because um, he had a lot to appear. He was a vain young man. He hadn't, uh, uh, he was jealous. He was angry. He was competitive. He was lustful. He was all of those things. So he had to grow through that and, uh, and fall back into nightmares and, and clean all that up. And then he became the most, um, uh, you know, uh, powerful man in Egypt, yeah. apart from the Pharaoh. And so the great dream had shown him what his soul was meant to do. And he saved his, his people because they were in famine and he fed them, right? He saved the people of Egypt. But if he had not done the work of the inner work of the dreamer, he would not have been able to bring to manifestation his great dream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think you talk about here the fact that the subconscious acts like programming in our computer, right? And, you know, what you talk about, unless you're consciously or accidentally open a specific program, it's going to sit there. It's right? going to sit, gonna sit there. there. Yeah. Um, and, and yet, this is part of, I think, you know, the powerful message of what you're bringing forward. You're helping people, and there are exercises in this book that really help us activate that computer program. Right. And then when we get an answer, we know what it is. I mean, well, there's also, there's also the, what I call the tikkun or the repair, because the answer can be half, half formed <laughs> or, or can show you, hey, th there's a problem here. There's a skin over that. You've got to peel off. <laughs> and, and so if you don't do that, you're not going to get your answer, your secret, your treasure, right? It, it's, so, it's so funny we're talking about this, though. Let me give you an example, because this is a practical part of this that I want people to hear. And, and I, mm. I don't mind embarrassing myself a little bit about it, because it's a really true story. When I lost my job after working from the mailroom to a corporate executive, and I woke up one day in 1990, and I didn't recognize myself. Yeah, Dr. Catherine, I didn't recognize myself. I was getting ready to walk out of my big fat house and get in my super fast sports car. And I'm down in a foyer area, foyer area, and I have a mirror. Every day I had to check my look because you're going into the big fat executive job. And I stopped in that mirror, which had gold rim around it. And it's not like you're saying mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest, but you kind of are. And the mirror says, I don't recognize you. You're unrecognizable. You're unrecognizable to yourself. And that was a turning point for me. And that day when I went back to work, I could not do what the company wanted me to do. It was inhumane to implement the first, second downsizing program in the United States and target people with senior seniority. One month, 29 years, so I couldn't do it. But I had, it was as if I had no control over what I would do next. I just knew something different for me. But here's what happened to me. I couldn't fire somebody and I told them to take my headcount and they did. And I found myself six months short of my own pension, but I never thought about it. All I could think about was going back to school. But here's an example of knowing. I knew I would get back into Columbia, even though my, I was on the verge of my application expiring. But then after that, I knew I picked a doctoral program. I was encouraged to do that by other people. And my first choice was Claremont. Was what? Claremont University in California. Oh, yeah. In California. I should have stopped there. But every, everything, what did you call about the stuff that gets in the way? That stuff, garbage. all of that, the garbage, <laughs> all the garbage then came up. And I went on a pathway where I applied to 25 other schools. Mm -hmm rejected by all of them for various reasons. Even Columbia, I sent my master's, I, I sent to the wrong department. But what school do you think put me on a wait list and accepted me a year later? Claremont. 
Yeah. And so I've often thought about how would I feel? How differently might I have felt at that time? If I'd have read this book, if I'd have understood more about myself, because in today's world, that's the way, that's the way I'm living. And it doesn't make sense to other people, to be honest with you, Dr. Catherine. It doesn't, but it does when we begin to, to work. I mean, I have tried for many, many years not to be too vos vociferous about it because people <laughs> will say, oh, it's magical thinking. You know, it's all magical thinking, but it's not. And I have my students verify. If the insight says, if you go out, you're going to um, lose your bracelet. Say, so take your bracelet, go out. If you lose the bracelet, a little tick in your dream book, you verify that you know. <laughs> and so in all of those little instances, I have them check. Or you look at your dreams. Oh, this showed me what was going to happen three weeks later. Tick. I am verifying. And the more you verify, the more you begin to believe your inner voice. So if, uh, let's say when you were young and it said Claremont, <laughs> that's all you needed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the reason I share that story, it's just one story. And, you know, what I love about it is the reason you and I are even talking today is the same thing happened to create a network like this. And yet I'm human. I'm like everybody else. The garbage does pile up. You know, the beast, you know, does show up. Um, but this is also about, as you say so beautifully in the book, and I would love for you to talk about, you know, when we come full circle and we take a look at repairing relationships and, oh my gosh, don't we need to do that? Don't we need to repair relationships in the world right now? We definitely do. I mean, people are completely polarized. Mm. It's frightening. It's black or white. And all the many layers and, uh, that make life beautiful yeah. are, are gone. We've yeah. lost the quality of being together. And I think that's part of the pandemic. It's also part of globalization, where people are so frightened they don't they have to create boundaries, artificial boundaries, to return back to something that they understand. And in the process, they radicalize. So it's, it's very sad. This is not the way of dreaming. The no, way it's of not. dreaming is, is relaxed. I ask the question, I wait, I receive the answer. That's Kabbalah. I receive, right? I look inside and I, and I see, right? So um, one of the things about relationships is that, that people have not understood at all is that there's a difference between emotions and feelings. And if one understands that, it's so much easier. Feelings used to be called virtue. Yes, that's right. People don't like that word anymore because it's too, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> puritanical or whatever. But it really is a difference between being constricted, I'm so angry, I'm constricted, to I'm in love and I'm all expanded. Well, love is a feeling, anger is an emotion. And when we begin to understand how we work inside, how our energy, our life force works inside, we have a handle on how to grow feeling. We need to grow feeling in, in our country. <laughs> Compassion. Caring, yeah. Yeah. love, right? Yeah, it's not it's not popular, but it's it's sure works better. I'll tell you though. Here's the thing. You know, um, I did an interview with a, a company that did a survey for. I think the they were referencing Generation Zers, and they're a recruiting company, and they talked about the finding in the survey. And usually when you interview people, you ask somebody, what do you want from your company, right? Do you want, actually, that's what I studied psychological contracts for 10 years. What happens when you violate them? You know, some of the more emotional research that just made me depressed. But when they did the study, here's what they found. See, they thought that they were going to come back and say, oh, money. I want to work for a company that's got money. Got ben no, they just across the board, it was some ridiculous percentage was like 96, 97% in, 
said compassion and empathy. I need to work at a place, compassion and empathy. And what I loved about the people that represent, I said, okay, did you take that back to companies? And they said, yes, we gave them the report. I said, no, that's not what I mean. Do you know if, if these companies in America, right? Do they know what to do with the data you found? Because you just did a great study and I would venture to say they're not alone. But what are they going to do with that? You see, because that's a culture change, isn't it? It is. And they, they never don't. answered that question. But, but um, <laughs> Dr. Pat, yes. I don't think that they know the difference. Again, I, I want to emphasize that yeah. between emotion, which yeah. is a movement out or a movement in, it's constriction, it's hard, and an expansion. Yeah. And compassion is an expansion. It's a generosity, it's a giving, it's a trusting. And, and this is a, a work that has to be done by, by the companies, by the families, by the couples. They have to learn how to do this. Right? To me, this is a big part of, of the work. And it's the best way to transform is through the imagery. There is no other way but to go into the subconscious. Yeah. and dream it. And that yeah. creates the transformation. Nothing else creates transformation like the subconscious. And it's very quick. You end the book with an invitation. I call it an invitation. You say something like, I wish you well as you plunge. Right. I love that phrase. <laughs> I have such a visualization of that. You know, Actually, the visualization I have is from the Matrix movies where they actually unplug Neo and they're pulling him out and he's just plunged down into this place to his freedom. Um, and then you go on to say the heart will reveal its treasures, right? Um, and, and you call them far surpassing the treasures of the mind. Trust your subconscious for it will always show you the truth. This is true. Hello, Pat? That is the gateway. See yeah. that if I don't, if and that's why you have to go back then and read the book again. Because what you then say is, this is my pathway to freedom. You know, this is my pathway to uh, unlimited possibilities. You know, this this really takes me away from fear, you know, and how fear can radiate in all different directions, Right. This takes us to a pathway that will allow us to not just see our dreams, but to be our dreams. And I wanted to ask you, that really is a very big part of the conversation and the book. Not to just see your dreams, but to be your dreams, right? Right. And seeing it removes us, right? It's, um, it's not about being removed. That's why I have a whole chapter on the difference between symbolism and, and true dreaming, true imagination, true dreaming is an experience. We're, we're in the experience. I'll give you an example of a lady who's an old student of mine and she very, very, she calls me up. She said, I have to see you right away. I'm very, very, very angry. And she was very, very, very angry. Comes into the office and spouts about her, how, how angry she is with her husband who'd lost his job six months before. And so when she finally let it all out, I said, good, close your eyes, breathe out, and return to the first time you fell in love. Well, because she was in that inner space, she felt it. Then she opened her eyes and she was very pissed at me. <laughs> she didn't want to feel that. But guess what? The next day, he got a job. And that to me is how it works, right? I know it sounds completely crazy, but she had opened up enough. She'd felt the love for a second and that allowed the, the dreaming to happen and for him to get his job. Yeah. yeah, and it is that quick. See, that's really the thing too that we can't say enough. It is that quick. It is instantaneous. It, it, it is just the way you described it. You know, I didn't think the moment I turned to Linda and said, I'm going to get a piece. I, I didn't think. I was, there wasn't any like logical, like, oh, let me. 
it was just something that came to me. And yet at the same time, so, so powerful. It's such a powerful way of being. And I wanted to thank you for bringing this to the forefront. I mean, you've done this many, many times in your teachings over the years. But this book in particular, for me, it, you know, I went back and I read multiple things, but also the exercises, the techniques in the book are so powerful. They're extremely it's, it's, powerful. Yeah. It's very simple, but, but um, yeah, this yeah. is, a, it, it, the whole thing is to create a little jolt that will push the mental out of the place, <laughs> right? Out of the way. <laughs> so we can truly look, right? Yeah. So we can truly dream. And I wanted to thank you. Would you mind telling folks how they can get a copy of the book, how they can find out more about you? And then I'd love to know your personal message for today. Well, I mean, the, the, the new website is coming up. It should be up tomorrow, I hope. Um, if not, it'll be Monday. And it's called theschoolofimages.org. And so on the, on the website, you can find everything about the school, the teachings, the the certifications and so forth. We have a lot of, of uh, teachers that have been certified. And then on all of the main platforms, you can get the book, like Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, um, and other mm -hmm. places where one buys books, right? I'm looking so, forward to seeing it yeah. on the website. <laughs> yeah. So it'll be on the website, and you can click on the website and buy mm -hmm. it right away. And, and audio Kindle will appear on the 25th of July. Mm. Thank you so much for today. What do you want to leave us with? What's your personal message? Just if you want to transform, plunge. <laughs> plunge into yourself. Plunge into inner gazing. Transformation will occur in the instant and will be definitive. It's the quickest way if you want to reach your dreams. I'm going to hold on to that. I'm going to just hold on to that very, very tightly. Thank you so much for joining Thank me. Thank you here. so much. I've enjoyed speaking with you a lot. <laughs> yeah. And for those of you out there, there's so much more in the book. I mean, it's fascinating. It's interesting, but you get to practice some of this. You get to transform. We'll see you next time, everyone. Mm -hmm.